morning I had the honor of meeting with Alexei Navalny's wife and daughter. One thing I made that was made clear to me is that uh, Yolanda is going to she's going to continue to the fight he had on the way. This is my video update on this Friday morning, February 23rd. Let's talk about some news. And let's start things off with the president of the United States in California on a campaign stop. And the reports are that at this campaign fundraiser campaign rally in California, Biden called Putin a crazy son of a B. Crazy SOB. That is what Biden, the president of the United States, called the president of Russia. Real good, Joe Biden. Real good look there. How embarrassing for the United States of America. How embarrassing to have this, this man, this president of the United States of America in public at a campaign rally at a campaign stop call the president of another country of any other country to call that person a crazy sob i'm waiting for the for the video and audio to to be released but i bet you i bet you that whoever was in attendance at this at this meeting or at this uh fundraiser whatever this thing was in california I bet you that the, the Secret Service, they went through everyone's phone and they erased this, uh, this statement from Biden. I put money on it that they did something like that. So there could be no audio or video leak of the president of the United States calling the president of another country a crazy SOP. What, what did they tell us when Biden was elected? <laughs> elected U.S. president. What did they tell us? That he's a foreign policy master? That he's the, the greatest uh, diplomat to ever, to ever enter the Oval Office? That he has a mastery of foreign affairs, foreign policy and diplomacy? What did they tell us? The adults, the adults are back in the White House. What a disgrace. What an embarrassment. Uh, Maria Zaharova, she responded to this statement from Biden, and she said, I quote, the next time Joe Biden decides to use the term crazy son of a B, he might try to remember that Americans best associate it with his own offspring, Hunter Biden, end quote. <laughs> So uh, Putin, he was, he was in the Kazan area, in the Kazan region, and uh, he decided to, to get into a Tu-160 uh, bomber, bomber jet, and he, he flew in, in this uh, bomber uh, airplane, this Tu-160, and then he got into a truck and drove this truck around uh, Kazan. <laughs> that was what Putin was doing yesterday. He was, he was getting into a fighter jet, a strategic bomber, and then he was driving a truck around uh, Kazan. And uh, he was asked by Pavel Zarubin, uh, Putin's favorite journalist. He follows Putin pretty much wherever Putin goes, he follows Putin. And uh, Pavel Zarubin, he asked uh, the Russian president to respond to this comment from Joe Biden. And what was Putin's response? Told you so. Biden is predictable. That's what Putin told Zarubin about a week ago when they sat down for an interview. And uh, Zarubin asked uh, Putin, who do you prefer, uh, Trump or Biden? And Putin didn't say that he prefers Biden. He just says that he said that Biden is predictable. That's what he said. Biden is predictable. And so uh, when asked about this uh, SOB statement that Biden made about him, Putin said, yeah, 
He's predictable. Just like I said in the interview that we that we had about a week ago. Let me let me read you exactly what what Putin said. Speaking at a fundraiser in California on Wednesday, Biden had called Putin a crazy SOB. Russian journalist Pavel Zarubin asked the Russian president to comment on this quote. When you asked me our preference for the next U.S. president, I said we would work with any. But for us, for Russia, Biden was better, Putin replied. Judging by what he said, I was absolutely right. That's the appropriate reaction to what I said. It's not like he could say, good job, Volodya. Thank you for the helping hand. We understand what is going on there in terms of internal politics. Biden's insulting comments mean I was right, Putin said. In terms of who Moscow would like to see in the White House, he added, I can say it again, Biden. (laughs) You know, I think I said this in my video last week when I was talking about the interview between Zarubin and Putin at like this, uh, I think it was this Moscow Future Forum. And they had a talk on the sidelines of this forum. And I said in the video where I was talking about uh, Putin's response, where he said that Biden is predictable. I said, uh, I said that a good, a good way for the Kremlin to like really troll Biden, to really make the Biden White House and the Biden campaign crazy is to just keep on saying that you prefer Biden or that Biden is predictable or that the Biden White House would be easier to to uh, to understand. <laughs> and uh, that is what uh, Putin seems to be doing here. He says uh, in this uh, this statement, he says, told you so. Biden is predictable for us. Biden is the choice <laughs> for for the president of the United States in 2024. And, and he's right. He is absolutely right. Uh, the the comment that he made last week. Uh, about Biden broke Biden's brain. <laughs> it broke Biden's brain and and Biden gets up in front of a crowd in California and he's like, Putin is a crazy SOB. <laughs> so last week, Putin's trolling of Biden last week worked. And, uh, and yesterday he said, yeah, we prefer Biden. <laughs> and this is going to drive Biden even crazier. The fact that Putin is saying, you see, he's predictable. We knew he would say I was uh, crazy. And uh, and we still go with Biden. We still prefer Biden. This is going to this is going to drive Biden, the Biden White House, even more crazy, man. Putin, Putin owns Biden. (laughs) Putin owns him. Trump owns Biden. No, Putin owns Biden. He lives in Biden's head rent free, (laughs) like rent free, man. Oh, boy. I, I like the the videos, the images which uh which have biden uh boarding air force one and they've they've actually made biden board air force one from from the from the back end because the stairs are are shorter (laughs) so so they've like made they found a way to to make the stairs uh shorter for biden to to get onto air force one in order to prevent any biden uh stumbling and falling down and he's still tripped up a little bit while getting onto air force one the other day this was like two days ago and then you have boot then you have putin climbing up the the stairs to get to get into the cockpit of the of the TU 160 <laughs> and Putin's doing it without any problem right and i thought putin was like was like suffering from from 20 heart attacks and his hands kept on shaking and he had a bum elbow and a bum knee <laughs> and he's flying around in uh in uh, airplanes and driving trucks around kazan <laughs> Oh man, yeah. <laughs> Putin completely owns owns the neocons. He completely owns the neocons and the neolibs, and they don't they don't realize that Putin owns them. That's the funny part about all of this. They they still have not realized that uh, that they're completely obsessed and jealous of Putin, and, and that Putin completely owns them, like twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> Putin lives in their heads, rent free. Anyway. <laughs> Oh boy. Instead of instead of saying Valodia, thank you, he calls me uh, a crazy SOB. <laughs> thank you for, for saying I was the better candidate, Valodia. Of course Biden can't say that. 
Of course he can't say thank you for endorsing me, Russian President Vladimir Putin. He has to call him a crazy SOP. Anyway, <laughs> enough of that. Enough of that. So uh, as Biden was in California, he decided to meet with uh, Yulia Navalny and uh, Navalny's daughter while he was in San Francisco. And uh, he posted on Twitter X or his social media team posted on Twitter X. Today, I met with Yulia and Dasha Navalnaya, Alexei Navalny's loved ones, to express my condolences for their devastating loss. Alexei's legacy of courage will live on in Yulia and Dasha and the countless people across Russia fighting for democracy and human rights. The countless people across Russia. Uh, fighting for that democracy and, and those, those human rights, those those values, <laughs> those international rules and values that uh, Navalny fought for. Anyway, uh, who, who meets, like what president of another country decides to meet with the wife of the opposition uh, leader? And I use the word opposition leader very loosely here. But... Uh, a president or a prime minister of another country meeting with the wife of the opposition leader who had died in prison of that country. And he was the citizen of that country. Who, who does this? Is that, is that not strange? Is that not weird? I think it's weird. I think it's strange. Anyway, uh, I think it's crystal clear what's going on. We've talked about it a whole bunch. Uh, Yulia Navalny, she is, she is going to be the, the new opposition uh, leader in, in Russia. You got, you got to keep the Putin regime change dream alive. And part of that regime change dream was, uh, was, was Navalny. He was uh, a part of that regime change dream. He was the face of that uh, Putin regime change. And... Uh, you have to now transfer that over to his wife, Yulia Navalny, and that keeps the the dream, the image of uh, the the regime change of of Putin and the the conquering and balkanization of Russia. It keeps this vision intact for all of the neocons and the neolibs. But it's so strange to have the president of the United States meet meet Navalny's wife. Why? Why are you taking a meeting with her? What's the reasoning behind it? We know what the reasoning behind it is, but I'm just throwing that out there. Biden gave Yulia a nice, a nice big, big Biden hug, right? That they had to post that photo of Biden hugging uh, Yulia. Strange, very strange. Anyway, uh, Biden, by the way, he called her Yolanda. After the meeting, he spoke with the media and uh, he called her Yolanda Navalny. <laughs> he doesn't even know her name. He wanted to say Yulia, but he calls her Yolanda. And then he mumbles something, says Yolanda's going to continue this fight, blah, 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 afterwards or something like that. He made, he made some statement where he's like, Yolanda, he, he says Yolanda Navalny. He doesn't even say Yulia. He says Yolanda Navalny is going to continue this fight, blah, blah, blah. He mumbled something, and then he continued. Uh, doesn't even know her freaking name. You don't know the name of the person that you guys are setting up to be the next uh, face of, of anti-Putin, and you don't even know this person's name. Graham, the other day, on, uh, on the mainstream media, he was calling Navalny, Navalny. He was saying Navalny. He didn't do it once. If it was once, then he misspoke. I misspeak all the time. <laughs> you know, when you're speaking, you mess up every now and then. But uh, he doesn't say it once. He says it twice, which means that he actually thinks that Navalny's name is Navalny. Even Graham doesn't know the, the name of, of who many people believe was, was their guy, right? He's like Navalny. And then he says Navalny again. And Biden is calling her Yolanda instead of Yulia. It's embarrassing, man. The whole thing is embarrassing. It's embarrassing that Biden, the president of the United States, took this meeting. It's very embarrassing. And other world leaders are looking on and they're seeing this. And they're shaking their heads. 
Anyway, he announced that he's going to put sanctions on Putin. Not on Russia, on Putin. He said, we are going to announce sanctions against Putin, who is responsible for his death tomorrow, the president told reporters after the meeting with Yulia Navalny. Yolanda Navalny. <laughs> we are not letting up. We are not letting up. We're going to continue to, to sanction Russia, to sanction Putin now. And we're not going to let up. As long as it takes, right? We know Putin did it. Biden knows Putin did it. He doesn't, he doesn't know her name. He doesn't know Navalny's wife's name, but he knows that Putin killed uh, Navalny. So uh, the story from Bloomberg that came out yesterday, which says that 10 legal experts have uh, said that it is okay for the collective West to steal, to seize the 300 billion in Russian frozen assets. According to Bloomberg, seizing Russian, seizing frozen Russian assets over Ukraine war wins endorsement of legal experts. Letter from scholars backing seizure is circulating in G7. It would be lawful under international law, 10 experts say. So magically, this, uh, this endorsement was obtained by Bloomberg. How did Bloomberg get this endorsement? I don't know. Don't know how they got this endorsement. But they ended up getting this endorsement, which I'm sure is going to ease many of the concerns of uh, the leaders of the collective West as far as uh, seizing these Russian frozen assets. The fact that you have 10 lawyers, 10, 10 legal scholars now saying it's OK to seize these Russian frozen assets. It means it's OK to seize these Russian frozen assets if you're a leader of the collective West. Right. Anyway, Bloomberg managed to, uh, to magically get to this report. 10 experts from Belgium, France, Germany, Japan, Netherlands, Great Britain, and the USA recommended that countries where assets were frozen transfer them to Ukraine. How convenient. <laughs> how convenient. And how interesting that all of these legal experts are located in, in countries aligned with, uh, with the Biden White House, with the permanent state. <laughs> how convenient that uh, the legal experts were found in these countries. I didn't see any legal experts in China or in India, but nah, they found legal experts in Germany and Japan and the UK and the Netherlands and Brussels, <laughs> Belgium, Brussels, of course. What institution is located in, in Brussels? I can't, I can't think. What institution is located in Brussels, in Belgium? And all of these legal experts... Like a whole bunch of these legal experts, um, they uh, they were like part of the Obama White House, or, or they've worked in the European Union. So no, no conflict there, right? <laughs> oh man, let me let me read you what Bloomberg is saying. So this document, Bloomberg obtained it from uh, from the G7. So this this argument was made to the G7, right? And Bloomberg got a hold of this document. Having given our most serious consideration to this issue, we have concluded that it would be lawful under international law for states which have frozen Russian state assets to take additional countermeasures against Russia, given its ongoing breach of the most fundamental rules of international law, the signatories claimed. According to their case, Russian state assets could be seized as compensation for the damage that has resulted directly from Russia's unlawful conduct which they define as an invasion and occupation of parts of Ukraine. The rules they allege Mo Moscow violated are indispensable to the foundation upon which the entire rules-based order is built, the letter states. The group also goes on to argue that the West sanctions and freezing of Russian assets were lawful countermeasures, but that they, but that any reprisal by Moscow would be illegal and illegitimate. Got, got that? <laughs> got that, everybody? So yeah, Mos the, the, Moscow cannot cannot retaliate. That would be illegal. So the West can steal Russians, Russia's assets, but Moscow, if it were to retaliate, that would be illegal. Steal Russia's assets, legal. Russia retaliate, illegal. <laughs> Moscow violated. It violated the. Uh, the international rules-based order. So yeah, you could steal their their assets. 
It's breach of the fundamental rules of inter international law. Does anyone have a list of, of, of the fundamental rules? Can we see the, the fundamental rules? Which, which clearly states that if one country is in conflict with another country, even if one country invades another country, where does it say in the rules that if a country, one country invades another country, then countries that are not a party to this conflict can steal the assets of that country and then give those assets to one of the countries that is involved in this conflict. Where, where does it say this in the international rules-based law, law book? Where, where does it say that in this book? Someone explain this to me. So, so what can, um, what assets can other countries take from the U.S. because of the U.S.'s invasion of Iraq? I mean, can, can, we, can we take the same expert legal thinking and attribute it to the U.S.'s invasion of Iraq? Or how about Libya? Or how about uh, Syria? I mean, the U.S., so the U.S. is still occupying, illegally occupying territory in the sovereign state of Syria. So can Russia, China, uh, Saudi Arabia, the United Kingdom, I don't know, France, can they steal, can they take U.S. assets and give them over to, uh, to Syria? Is that how this all works now? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, let's see here. Some of the some of the people, some of these experts that they found, they uh, they worked at the U.S. State Department, legal advisor at the U.S. State Department under Obama. Another person cited in this report is a former career diplomat who worked as a strategic consultant for the current U.S. administration. And another person, another expert, was a keynote speaker at a pro-Ukraine webinar, webinar on seizing the Russian assets in December. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, these guys are completely legit. <laughs> these guys are, are completely objective, right? Oh, boy. So they really want to get their hands on the 300 billion. They really want to get their hands on the 61 billion. That is a clear indication that Project Ukraine is wrapping up. When the, when the globalist political class, when they want to get their hands on whatever last, last money they can get their hands on, that's when you know that, that they're about to wrap up Project Ukraine. They have, to pay, they, have to, they have to pay everybody now. You know, they made a lot of promises with regards to Project Ukraine to a lot of, to a lot of big companies and oligarchs and and other people and other institutions, they made a lot of promises that you guys are gonna become filthy, crazy rich when we take over at the Kremlin and balkanize the Russian Federation. And all of these companies and people and oligarchs and institutions, they bought into this promise. And now they're, they're expecting some sort of compensation for the failure that is Project Ukraine. So yeah, they have to get their hands on the 61 billion. They have to get their hands on the 300 billion wouldn't it be funny if if the united states the united states has 100 billion europe has something like 200 billion frozen wouldn't it be funny if if uh europe steals the 200 billion wrecks the trust in their financial uh institutions in their financial markets and the united states promising that they'll steal the 100 billion then says you know uh, we decided to change our mind and we're not going to, to steal the, the 100 billion after all. <laughs> and, and Europe's financial system is completely wrecked. Trust in Europe is completely wrecked. And uh, investors and, and, uh, and, and oligarchs and countries that take their money out of Europe and out of the euro and pour it into the USD and, uh, and the United States. Wouldn't that be interesting if that was to happen? <laughs> Europe is dumb enough to actually go along with this. The EU is dumb enough to actually go along with this. Oh boy, anyway, that's that's the story with the with the frozen assets. Everyone is telling them don't do it, but yet they found 10 experts to say no, this is a good idea. <laughs>
50, 50 intel experts, 50 retired intelligence experts claim that the, the Hunter laptop is Russian disinformation. <laughs> 10 legal experts say that seizing Russian frozen assets is, uh, is okay under international law. <laughs> so you have a German lawmaker. He came out yesterday with a statement saying that uh, Germany and that Europe should absolutely seize the Russian frozen assets, steal the Russian frozen assets, not because it's okay under international law, but because of Navalny. That's what uh, a German uh, MP said. Seize frozen Russian assets in Navalny's name, German MP. Legislation allowing such a move should be called Navalny laws, Norbert Rotkin said. Russia's assets that remain frozen in the West should be confiscated in response to the death of opposition activist and anti-corruption campaigner Alexei Navalny, German parliament member Norden Rotkin has said. So yeah, let's create the Navalny law. And uh, in this instance, we'll use the Navalny law to seize Russia's frozen assets because of Navalny, right? But you know, in time, the Navalny law, because now it's going to be called the Navalny law, the Navalny law can be used to, or should we say the Navalny, if you go by Lindsey Graham, or the Yolanda, the Yolanda, the Yolanda Navalny law. Uh, th this could be used to, to seize the assets of, I don't know, India? I don't know, uh, China? Saudi Arabia? United Arab Emirates? Hungary? Serbia? Brazil? It, it's, it's the Navalny law. The Navalny law says that we can seize your assets. You see where they're going with all of this? Anyway, let's now talk about uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan and Pashinyan. Pashinyan, the prime minister of Armenia. He has decided, if you go by his statements, to uh, pull out of the CSTO, the one organization that is actually protecting Armenia from uh, Azerbaijan, Pashinyan has decided to pull out of the collective security, uh, collective security treaty organization, I believe is what CSO stands for. And it's, and it's this very institution that is actually preventing uh, Azerbaijan from, from cutting through Armenia and creating a land corridor to Nak, Nakchivan, if I'm not mistaken, which is a, an, an Azerbaijan enclave separated from the rest of, of Azerbaijan and between this enclave and Azerbaijan is Armenia. And, and my read on this is that uh, the minute Armenia pulls out of the CSTO, Azerbaijan is going to say, well, uh, here, we, here we come, Azerbaijan enclave, which is, which is right on the border of Iran, if I'm not mistaken, I've got my geography. Correct. I'm working off of, off of memory here, but I think that's right. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm not the best with, with geography, by the way. <laughs> anyway, uh, Pashinyan, he said, quote, We believe that in Armenia's case, the treaty has not been implemented, especially in 2021, 2022, and it couldn't be unnoticed. We have suspended our participation in this treaty. We'll see what happens next. That is what Pashinyan said. We'll see what happens next. Gee, what's going to happen next, Pashinyan? What could possibly happen next? He's, he's purposefully um, pushing Armenia over the cliff so that he can, so that he can somehow, in his, in his weird thought, he thinks that, that the more conflict there is in Azerbaijan, the better in uh, Armenia with Azerbaijan, the better chances Armenia has to integrate into, into NATO and into the European Union. This is his rationale for all of this. That was his rationale for Nagorno-Karabakh. This is his rationale now for pulling Armenia out of the CSTO. And the Armenian defense minister yesterday signed, uh, signed a weapons agreement or defense pact with France. So France is going to provide air defense and other weapons to Armenia. Why would you want to go with France when you have Russia? And you've seen what Russia does to NATO and to NATO weapons, but yet you decide to, to go with France. You've seen what Russia does to, to French air defense. 
Why, why sign an agreement with France? Why? Russia is your neighbor, but yet you're going to sign a, a strategic agreement with France. Anyway, you know, you're prime minister. You were voted. I guess you were voted in as prime minister. So if this is the, if this is the decision that Pashinyan wants to make, so be it. But uh, he's saying, we'll see what happens next. We know what's going to happen next. Even though Azerbaijan has said that they have no interest in creating a, a corridor to to connect to, to this enclave. That's what Azerbaijan said, said a couple of, of weeks ago or a couple of months ago. I think we can all see what's, what's going to happen in the future. Anyway, that's, uh, that's what's going on there. And uh, let's do a couple of, of more stories, maybe some pre-clown clown worlds, and then we'll get to our clown worlds. So Ursula, she announced that uh, there's going to be a delay in uh, Ukraine's EU accession talks until after the EU elections in uh, early June. That's what Ursula said. So after the EU elections, that's when uh, Ukraine and the EU will talk about Ukraine's accession into the European Union. What elections is Ursula talking about? <laughs> Does she mean the EU appointments? <laughs> Who's going to be appointed? into positions of power at the European Union, because I don't know what she's talking about where she's, when she says EU elections. <laughs> anyway, uh, Mark Rutte, the current, I guess he still is the current prime minister of uh, the Netherlands and uh, the outgoing, let's say the outgoing leader of the Netherlands. It looks like he is going to be appointed NATO uh, secretary general. He's won the endorsement of France, the UK, Germany, and Kirby the other day said that the US supports Mark Rutte to take over for Stoltenberg. So I don't know, are you going from bad to worse now? I mean, Stoltenberg is bad, but uh, Mark Rutte, oh boy. Well, I guess he did a great job wrecking the Netherlands, destroying the Netherlands, destroying the lives of, of farmers in the Netherlands. And so I, he's going to get rewarded now for the, for the great work that he did as Prime Minister of the Netherlands. He's going to take over for Stoltenberg. Anyway, that is, that is the news there. Uh, what else should we, say, should we talk about? How about a clown world? Biden's dog, Commander, according to CNN, bit Secret Service 24 times. 24 times. Biden's dog bit Secret Service. They had to change their whole protocol because of the dog. That's what CNN is reporting. Not a reflection of the dog. It's a reflection on the, on the owner of the dog. It shows you what type of owner Biden is, what type of personality Biden is when his dog is biting Secret Service 24 times. And we have one more clown world, which is Google's AI chatbot, Gemini which is being ridiculed on all sides, on, on, the, on the woke side of things and on, the, and on the normal, I guess the normal side of things. Uh, because when you prompt Google's Gemini chatbot to create images, it, it gets everything wrong. And, um, and according, well, according to the New York uh, Times, this is what they say, Google chatbots, AI images put people of color in NAZI era uniforms, the company has suspended Gemini's ability to generate human images while it vowed to fix the historical inaccuracies. Yeah, the historical inaccuracies. The real story here is that Google, they've, uh, they've slipped up. They've slipped up and they've actually told us they're true. They've revealed their true intentions to misinform us. This debacle has revealed that artificial intelligence is going to be used by these big companies and by the governments, because the governments have a stake in all of this. In any country you go around the world, the governments are going to take an active role in AI. Uh, this, has, this has shown us that what they plan to do is to use AI to misinform and manipulate us. I think that's the real story. Not the fact that these images weren't historically accurate, but the real story is that this reveals their true intentions, which are to, to mislead and manipulate everybody. And that's what AI is going to be used for. That's what it's going to be used for by the big companies. That's what it's going to be used for by the governments in partnership with these big uh, AI companies and these AI tools.
And that should scare everybody. So that's what this has revealed. AI is going to change, manipulate, rewrite everything that we know about the real world and about history. Anyway, that's the video, everybody. The Durant.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, Bitchu, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Duran shop. 15% off all t-shirts. Take care.